and gentlemen. Now, I would like uh, from the floor any, any questions of any sort to any members of the panel, please. Thank you. Lady here. Um, my name's Alison Briggs from the Shire Group of Internal Drainage Boards. Uh, I think Paul Hamnick was the first one to mention in his objectives this morning about a partnership approach and IDBs getting things done. Just one thing I want to mention, certainly the number of boards in the Shire Group of uh, Drainage Boards, most of the catchments are pumped. Um, the largest percentage of income that comes in is actually spent on electricity costs for those pump stations. Only a small percentage is actually on drain maintenance. For the boards in the Shire Group as well, the very high percentage of IDB income actually comes from the special levy paying councils in the area rather than from, from landowners. I'm aware of difficulties under the Local Audit and Accountability Act. Any budget increase that forces a 2% uh, increase on council tax could tr trigger a referendum. And in a number of instances, the local authority representatives that sit on drainage boards are very anxious that budgets shouldn't be increased, that costs should be kept down as much as possible. There's, we're well aware that the Environment Agency aren't able to undertake the sort of maintenance in rivers that people are accustomed to seeing them do, and there has been a number of suggestions that IDBs could take over this, this role and responsibility. But to do that, it comes at a cost, it comes at a price. Certainly, internal drainage boards wouldn't be able to undertake work that the Environment Agency have done in the past, as well as doing drain maintenance as well, without increasing the penny rate, without asking for more money coming in. The other thing that sometimes perhaps people seem to forget is because internal drainage boards are public bodies, they are accountable in exactly the same way as the Environment Agency or local authorities when it comes to spending money. You have to be able to prove that what you're doing is of benefit. Benefit to whom? Does it, how does it help the greater good? And the one thing that I would try and suggest to all internal drainage boards and any farming members in the room who sit on internal drainage boards is get your evidence, actually get your districts modelled then you will be able to prove that the actions you are undertaking or that you hope to undertake are of benefit to a greater community and not just sometimes the perception is it benefits landowners only. Craig, would you like to uh, take that one on board first? Oh, Dorothy. Sorry, Dorothy. Right, Dorothy, have a go. Thank you. Well, I was just going to say that the CLA is really keen on IDBs and we'd really like to see IDBs take on more responsibility. We feel that their sort of localism in action and their local knowledge means that work is often done uh, in a very economical way and effectively. We are lobbying hard to get uh, some exemption for IDBs from the capping proposals in the Local Audit and Accounting Bill, so that should help. I think that the other issue we have with IDBs at the moment is, is the problems of setting up new ones and uh, the, the restrictions that can be caused if, if local authorities aren't supportive of the proposal. Um, but uh, certainly IDBs are our flavour of the month. Anybody else on the panel? Uh, just to open up, not working. Thank you. Yeah, just to say that I think we're, the Environment Agency is very keen to work with IDBs or River Trusts, <coughs> any local organisations who can do uh, things better. And we already uh, use quite a number of the IDBs in Yorkshire uh, to deliver work for us. So, you know, I think we, we're keen to work with IDBs, uh, use local knowledge. Um, and, and, you know, we perhaps even need to think about demaining some rivers as well. It might be we haven't got the mix quite right, uh, and it would be better in some places to demain. But I do recognise the point Alison's made about well, there's, there's a tricky funding conundrum here at the moment, isn't there? And we're all digging into the same pot, and at the moment the pot isn't getting any bigger. I think I'd like to just say, actually, this is one of the points we will definitely take down to Mr Rogerson when we go. The speed that the change from... IDB, uh, from the Environment Agency back to the IDBs is too slow. It's got to be speeded up. The time is right now. We have got to take that challenge on board. Charles, I would just Sorry. say the, the pilot scheme that we talked about earlier and the um, Winesford drain this year, um, the South Holderness Drainage Board have been very pleased with how that's gone so far. 
And they find that the, the outlet pumps now work at full capacity, which they've been running at 50% so far. So it's been success with them so far, this um, pilot scheme. Okay. Uh, gentleman here on the right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Peter Turner, and I am the elected member for Mid Holderness for the East Riding of Yorkshire Council. I live in the village of Burstwick, which you will recall that in 2007 was extremely badly flooded. And the reason I stood up is because I am the council's representative on the South Holderness Internal Drainage Board, which has just been amalgamated and is in fact chosen as one of the pilots by the EA. I think all these things are very promising. But in the seven years that I've been involved in looking at flooding in Holderness, one thing has come over so much strongly than anything else, and that is that for far too long, the local understanding, the knowledge and the experience has at been best ignored and at worst deliberately ignored. It must stop now. We've got the opportunity. We are starting to work together, and again, that is a priority. We must work together, and we must be seen to work together. Thank you. Would anybody like to answer that, or do we all agree? agree. We all agree. <laughs> the guy sat next to you actually had a, a question to ask. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, interestingly, I'm, I'm the South East Holderness Ward uh, member for East Riding. We just succumbed to the latest flood event at Wellick and Skeffley, and Kilnsey is still drying out, as you probably well know. One of the problems that we've had, and I've sat on all five drainage boards for a few years now, is the fact that we recommend things that ought to be done, and then we go and try to get permission to get it done. What you need to do is cut away some of the red tape. You've got to allow us to do what we do best. I'm an engineer, a marine engineer, so therefore I don't know anything about growing plants and, and the land. What I do know about is the farmers are the custodian of this land and we should allow them to do their work. There are very few, few rogues amongst them. We've got to give them the credit and the credence that they deserve. They will help you and they will do the job right. And it's long past time that that happened. And Craig, go back and give the message and don't just nod nicely as you usually do. Cheers. Thank you for those very kind words. Uh, pretty, pretty nice to hear somebody speak about farmers in that uh, manner. Thank you. John, would you like to? Uh, as a representative of farmers and growers, we're responsible for the skin of the earth, which, if we treat it wrong, it acts like a sheet of black plastic and sends the water straight down to the lowlands. If we treat it right, the water infiltrates correctly, and we've got it underneath, initially for our own use, later for in the groundwater. I'd like to ask Elizabeth how we can improve the permeability and the porosity of the soil and has the de recent decrease in soil organic matters anything to do with the increase in runoff? The soil organic matter has a really strong link to water holding capacity, particularly the bit that you're most interested in, which is the bit that is available water. So the more... In mineral soils, the more organic matter you have, the more available water you have, the more resilience you have against uh, summer drought events for taking particularly cereal crops, grass crops, through uh, a short summer drought period. So organic matter is really critical for that. Um, and there are a number of things that you might be able to do as farmers to address that, but it's an economic issue. It's a balancing issue that, that each farm needs to make the decisions about how they manage that appropriately. Um, porosity, permeability, strongly linked mostly about macro porosity and connection of pores to the surface. There were real issues actually with winter cereals if they're in very late. 
or any winter crop that's in very late because what you create by tilling and if you do that not by zero till you create you destroy that continuity and you basically create a, a surface sponge which which actually can be a problem for the crop setting off as well so there are issues with very late sort of october november um cereals particularly if the weather's wrong but who knows the biggest issue is just building in resilience to the systems um to allow them and the catchment as a whole from the, the uplands to the lowlands as we heard to work together most effectively to to manage the water flows so it's not simply a soils issue it's a really integrated one thank you gentlemen at the back right at the very back Right at the very back. I think he thinks we've forgotten. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Christopher Tetley. I'm a retired farmer in Rydale. I've got a question specifically, please, to Andy Tordoff. Andy, could you tell me just how many people are employed by the Environment Agency in Yorkshire? Roughly. Uh, no, short answer. <laughs> well, you won't be able to answer the second question. Uh, I think so I, think I want to talk to the chap in the middle. <laughs> yeah, in the... In I'm the, so sorry. Right. Well, it's a bit hard to break down, but we, the organisation is divided into regions. The Yorkshire and North East region, which goes from the Scottish border down to the North Bank of the Humber and from the coast to the spine of the Pennines, we have just over 900 staff. Uh, in that part of the organisation covering Yorkshire, Durham, Teesside, Northumberland, um, covering not just flood risk management, of course, but all of the other work I mentioned in terms of um, working with water companies, regulating industry, waste management, and a variety of other things. And could you tell me how many of those are actually in the field force and capable of going out and doing the donkey work on our flood defences? Uh, I can't give you the exact number for the number of people in flood defence. There are about 300 would you say? More be actually be six, 450, I'm guessing. On the operations side, it's just under 100. Just under 100. Yeah, just, just be clear, that's that staff who are actually out, operational staff who are maintaining flood banks and inspecting them. Exactly. We also have a lot, from, lot of from, other, from the borders down to... Yeah, that's, that's part of the work. And then we have a lot of other staff who are out inspecting defences, uh, doing mechanical works, engineering works. So it's several hundred who are field operatives really. Uh, in fact the, the region is 99% is, is an operationally fake, facing organisation. Uh, that's where we do all of our work on the ground. All right, thank, thank you very much for that. I'd just like to make one other observation which um, uh, was highlighted by Richard Bramley's excellent talk and he made so many good points. I'd just like to bring up on one of them which was also highlighted by Steve Pace who has spent 10 years talking about the Hull um, water problem. And, um, and Richard said, we've done enough talking. I think this has been a good meeting this afternoon, but I hope to goodness it's the last one. We really need to get a move on. And I'll give you a short example that I saw, nothing to do with water, but it was in the paper the other day, apropos the um, dreadful damage to the Dawlish railway line. Um, they said they were going to get it mended in six weeks. When Japan had its earthquake and tsunami, they had pictures of a railway line far, far worse than Dawlish. It was mended in six days. Now let's get a move on. Have we any more questions? A lady on the, a lady on the top now. Thank you. My name's Di Keel. I'm a Norton on Derwent Town Councillor and also a Rydale District Councillor. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments and then really ask a question. We've heard an awful lot this afternoon about partnership working. Um, and I'd like to um, direct a question directly to Yorkshire Water on this. I live in a community that has been protected by flood defences since 2001, for which the residents locally are very grateful. And I know one of our speakers has said we haven't mentioned the word defences. Well, I'd like to mention it because we have been very well protected and they have saved us from flooding on numerous occasions. But we did find in 2012 and on several 
occasions over the last few years, that there is one small piece of the jigsaw that protects Malta and Norton from flooding that is missing and is still causing, um, as happened in 2012, major incidents in my community where people are surrounded and in some cases inundated with foul sewage. So my question is to Yorkshire Water, when are you going to come to the table and join in these partnership discussions and do something about your Victorian sewers that really let people down? It is unacceptable in this day and age for people to be surrounded by raw sewage and I'd like to see you take some action. And perhaps if you weren't pouring so much money out to your shareholders, you might be able to take some action and support people on the ground. Thank you. Well, I think all I can say for, in response to your question, because my expertise is certainly not in sewer flooding, is I can take your details afterwards and we can follow it up and see what the exact nature of the issues are that you're raising. But I think there are... Sewer flooding is an issue. We accept that as an issue. And I think that there is a, the move is to do things in partnership. We will be doing more in partnership in the future, uh, working to resolve issues which we cannot resolve on our own. But uh, I'm afraid uh, my expertise is more on the abstraction and water resource management side of, the, of what we're doing. But i um, quite happy to talk to you afterwards. Andrew here. Thank you. As Richard Brown very ably pointed out, margins are slim enough as it is. Now, through some of the perhaps our DPE money, is the scope through, particularly with spring cropping, is a topical issue, particularly from grassroot point of view, of some sort of incentive for cover cropping to soak up some moisture and improve the organic matter in the fields. Um, another issue I just like or a point I'd like to make, somebody I was talking to at lunchtime made the point that it's revenue that's required, not capital. Richard made an example of a, the EA promising to do some maintenance on some electrical work that just isn't happening. It's already spending all this money on flood defences and, and all this other work towards reducing the issue, but all these things need to be maintained and I think there needs to be a bit of perspective in it. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, two points then. RDPA, yes, let's have a conversation afterwards um, and we'll see how that can uh, um, play out. As I said um, earlier, the the whole of the new RDPE program is, is still being debated, so there is room to manoeuvre, room to add things in, but quite frankly, this is the reason that we have these debates, it's to understand what needs to be added in. So you're kind of pushing an open door, let's do that afterwards. Second point, um, I was talking to somebody earlier over lunch about the issue of revenue and uh, capital, and it, it struck me from a former life in the country forward that there was exactly the same problem. There was always money available for capital investment, but the challenge was then keeping it maintained and keeping it running for a period of time. Um, and your points have been well made, uh, kind of in that regard, to do with a different subject. Um, they're one of my top two or three that are pinging their note to the Minister uh, almost before I leave today, but I've talked to Charles as well about how we um, take that point forward. Because if there's nothing else I take away today, but there will be, but that's, that is kind of one of the top top things. And, and finally, I think I would say on uh, kind of Richard's presentation, I've got his card, and I need him to send me a copy of the presentation, because for me that encapsulates um, beautifully um, the challenges that we face, uh, and that I can easily send to the Minister so he can see and, and you know, look at in, in a very, very short space of time. Always good when you're trying to get a, a ministerial year. Oh, thank you. I just want to say that the EA are definitely withdrawing from maintenance of some of the flood banks, and this is an issue. I think that our private farmers and landowners would be happy to take on some of that maintenance work, but there's a real um, issue about public liability if they take on that work and then, then it fails, you know, do they become liable for flooding downstream and things like that? And so I think there are bigger issues that can be sorted out here to help people help themselves. Mm. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're right there, Dorothy. And, and these are all points that I would like you to put forward so when we do make that, I just think we can express that. 
Yeah, I know that 7% that I manage prior to root crops is going in with cover crops and gradually building up to 20% of the farm with such cover crops. As a consequently, I'm banging on the door of uh, DEFRA for yet another reason, and that is it needs to be part of greening. Now, they're quite expensive once you dig down into uh, buying the seed and, and getting them well established so that they work well and they do the job of building organic matter which is one of the plethora of reasons why I'm doing it. And, um, yeah, so some financial assistance through RDPE would be a good thing, but I think it would be better if it was considered and valued highly in greening, and that would certainly be one way to get people's interest in, um, in cover crops. And, you know, on the capital um, versus maintenance thing, this is something I sent through to our flooding issues group um, uh, and a few head office Cap investment in capital works goes hand in hand with increased maintenance budget the more stuff you build the more staff and money you need to look after these structures this applies to all existing flood defences current policy is that maintenance budget is being eroded and therefore the value of the initial investment is going to be reduced and we've got this 1 to 18 rule or whatever it is 1 to 8 I'm hearing different things about whether something is valued and it will be done on such a basic tick box model that it is almost worthless. There is far more to consider when it comes to capital investments than just purely something that happens to fit some formula that somebody's come up with. We need to be a lot more, um, think a lot broader about the other ways we can get benefits and the real long term um, uh, issues around the fact that the more money you spend on capital works, the more money you need on maintenance, because all you do is reduce the lifespan, which affects your calculations. So. We just, um, we are working with DEFRA to try and help them understand the link between capital and revenue. So we've been doing a lot of modelling to explain you know, the tipping point between investing in assets and then starting to fail and the capital cost increasing. So we are furnishing Jeff with more information to help them make the case uh, around revenue funding. But clearly the issue is that the whole public sector faces, faces a difficult um, financial situation. So my job in the meantime is just to make sure that every pound we use, we use well. Um, I think Richard's presentation was, was very uh, moving and I think we talked a lot about uh, when we see homes flooded and how devastating that is and how it can uh, devastates people's lives. I think your presentation helps me to understand a bit more about uh, the devastating impact on a, on, a, on a farmer as well, so that's very useful. Um, I, I do think, though, that uh, in the meantime, while the politicians decide where to, to sit on all of this, um, uh, you know, in spite of some of the, some of the comments across the table, think, you know, we are absolutely committed locally to working with people who understand their catchments, and I think you're nodding because we've done that a lot in the past. We are doing some innovative work uh, in the upper uplands already, Pickering's a case in point. Um, and we are keen to look at any innovative solutions that help us these tackle these problems. But you know, we, none of these are easy solutions and we, we face some real funding challenges. So there's no quick, easy answers here. Uh, but there's a connection act from the Environment Agency to work with local people to find local solutions. Okay. Um, Martin Bowles, uh, farming the uh, whole farm. I feel as though I've just got to defend Steve Pearce for the start. He's only just been um, uh, put into the job for doing the River Hall Flood Risk Management Strategy. Uh, I think he's doing a really good job at the moment. Um, but the question really is around IDBs and how they're funded. And how uh, there's been talk this morning of more work being put onto the IDBs. Uh, I'm sure most of them can take it on, but one thing we need is the funding. Uh, have we got to the point where we need to um, raise levy money from more farmers, more landowners, more people that rely on the drainage system, um, who are not paying anything at the moment towards uh, actually cleaning the, um, the internal drainage bulb ditches out? Um, there's going to be more and more work for the drainage boards to do. Uh, and I, I think that the, the, the um, possibilities of raising money from a bigger area has got to be part of it, or 
government have got to sort out how the drainage boards are going to be funded. Because at the moment, they can't do any more than they're doing at the, at the moment. Thank you. Paul, what are people doing in Sandia? How much do they pay? Um, well, <laughs> this, uh, uh, drainage rates in, in, across Anglia vary considerably um, as the, the, the general drainage charge. I, mean, I, I think you're opening a very um, interesting issue in the, uh, to the extent in which upland and lowland water contributions are made. I think that has to be a local issue. Uh, sorry. Uh, I just uh, I the Shire group again. I'd just really like to be able to respond to that. Uh, some neighbour remember the, um, the wanting to set up IDBs in Cumbria and in Kent, and I think the problems have already been highlighted earlier that the sort of county councils and local authorities that are, don't want to fund um, drainage board activity. But I think that the drainage boards, to be able to extend to a catchment, would be, if only legislation would allow it, would be a really quite good idea. But I, I, I can't enforce enough um, that I believe that if, if drainage boards particularly want to undertake work or want to be able to increase the funding, they've got to be able to produce scientific evidence of what they're talking about. And it, it's really no use in saying, well, we know we write because we've always done it in this way. We've got to produce scientific evidence, and I believe the only way in doing that is the drainage boards to model their districts. Uh, it may well be that local levy funding is available to help with studies, that sort of thing, but... When you have the scientific evidence that says, if you turn off this pump station, this is what happens, this is where it floods, you then better understand yourselves whether you can move uh, flood waters from one catchment in, in another to alleviate problems. It's all about getting the scientific evidence, and, and once drainage boards have that, you stand, you're in a much better position to place an argument for funding. <coughs> Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Martin. Is that on? Mm. I, I, I agree with you, Martin. And you know, and I think as farmers, is that on? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. And I think as farmers, we can't expect not to have to um, contribute. And even as an existing levy payer, I can see that there would be, um, you know, uh, there should be an increase, possibly from us as well. You know, if we're having to deal with this more. Then, you know, fair enough. We put our hands in our pocket and we, we contribute. But one of the one of the issues that I've got with you know with your scientific model is that there are a lot of if you like more woolly circumstances which you just can't fit to something like that, like the one to eighteen rule. And if we are genuinely taking food security seriously, <laughs> rising sea levels and things like that which are macro, they're almost beyond government <laughs> issues, and they're something that we're not thinking about for the next generation, but for you know, probably my grandchildren at the end of this century, you cannot fit it to a model like that. And that is where you know, that, having that approach does fail. I think with the um, EA's withdrawal of maintenance on, on um, a lot of the river systems, we need um, urgent, clear, practical guidance on how to manage these watercourses. Obviously, the EA have got a little experience of, of managing over the last um, 20, 30 years, and that experience needs to be passed on with the kind of experience of our drainage boards to take forward. Yeah, and I mean, and we're not just going to walk away from things. We need to work with you to, to transition things across. Um, I mean, I think over many, many years now, government policy has been very clear that we, uh, we've had to look at every flood defence we've got and work out which ones are providing the greatest benefit and put the money there first because the demand on resources is so high across the whole of the country. So that's been happening for quite a while now. Uh, I think we're getting to a critical point now across Yorkshire where some of the defences are really starting to look uh, very old and, and are starting to show the signs of, of lack of maintenance. So I think we are reaching a tipping point and I've talked, spoken to a few people already today about some of the defences on their land that have failed and they've uh, actually restored them themselves. I'm keen to help people with that, but this is where the conversation has to take place, and we, we, we transition across uh, and share expertise and knowledge. When are you planning to withdraw from the swell you're in it? Uh, well, we, we, we have a, a policy on, on when or if I have will withdraw, and we don't just do it overnight. We, we start talking to people first, and then we give 
quite an extensive period of notice if we are going to do it, probably about two years, I think. Um, I think we've already started some, consults, some conversations on the swell and the year and the mid uh, to start to indicate that you know, we cannot uh, do much more um, given, given the current policy and the criteria for our, for our investment. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say we, we won't help people get through consenting requirements and we've got the pilots running already across, across the country. Um, so I think this is, this is really is where we need local conversations, local trust as well, uh, and the ability to be honest with each other. Um, thank you. Um, while the emphasis is very much on, on what's happening in the here and now and potential solutions and finger pointing and blame perhaps, um, I'd like to sort of bring us back around to a couple of the speakers, Paul this morning on, on water in itself and Richard just touched on the point of future uh, food policy and food security going forward. I do think we shouldn't forget in all of this um, how critical water will be in the future. I attended the Oxford Farming Conference and there was a research fringe meeting and the guys involved there highlighted the fact that we could possibly look at 20 tonnes to the hectare in the future. Now I'm not taking anything away from you know the people who are suffering in flooding in the local area and Richard himself, but I do think we mustn't forget, we mustn't lose the um, challenge and the ideas going forward, how we secure water as an industry going forward, because I think it's hugely important, because the guy that was talking about a possibility of 20 tonnes per hectare for us as farmers, he said we'll never make it because water will be such a challenge going forward. And when you look at other things coming along down the road, such as fracking, which is going to use a huge amount of water, and so on and so forth, I'd like to see you know the panel really focusing on the future as well. Um, thank, thank you for that. Um, and I, I guess what I'd um, like to stress, <laughs> what I'd like to stress, thank you, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, very, the, the, the very useful conversation we've had over the last 10 minutes about the, the potential role of the internal drainage boards in, in managing flood water and drainage. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I, I think there's a, there's a, there's a view, um, and we're starting to see some action, that the IDBs can hold a much wider function than that in, in the you know, more global management of water. Um, so the sort of IDBs that are closer to me, I accept, fully accept that local conditions have, can be very different. But IDBs are increasingly managing water on behalf of the local farming community to use those drains and ditches as, as mass storage um, and allow the transfer of water between different farmers for when they use it. Um, and we're now seeing the farmers in those areas whose, whose whole, whole sort of uh, historical uh, access to water has been controlled by the drainage um, uh, emphasis and I've, I've now fallen themselves into abstractive groups to, to sort, of, sort of, we've got a dual use and function of these sorts of things. And I just invite you all to think um, in the widest possible sense about how we might link all these apparently disparate issues, bring them all together uh, for the benefit of, um, of, as I said in my talk, what for both too much and too little water. Okay. We'll just take one more question and then I think we're going to just draw, sorry, we'll take a couple of questions then. The one at the back up here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Mike Higg, I'm manager of land, just a few of you speak from a more Hellfield farmer friend. Um, I'm not a native Yorkshireman, I've been here 20 years, but in 20 years, um, the land that I manage borders the River Wolf, and the only communication we've ever had from the Environment Agency is when they were coming to raise the river banks. And we also have a big major uh, drainage tank runs down through the farm, uh, carrying water from Cottonthorpe and local drainage boards into the river. Now, I listen um, to the Environment Agency representative there saying it's all about communication. Within 20 years, um, the Environment Agency have never once communicated with 
and myself or neighbouring farmers about the effects of the work that they're doing in retaining water on, on farmland, not once. I'm also on a local drainage board and uh, the environment, to my knowledge, have never asked the drainage board for their opinion either. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear, to say, hear him say that he's going to communicate, um, but it will remain to be seen whether he actually does. Um, so I, my question is, I was making a point really, but my question is, are you actually going to fulfil what you say and communicate with people on the ground and the drainage boards who have the knowledge and you're not actually just saying it? Um, well, I'm sorry to hear you make that point because that's not the kind of uh, organisation we are, and I'm very surprised. And I'll, I'll follow up with you afterwards, actually, because I'm staggered. Uh, it'd be extremely rare for us to go on somebody's land and not communicate with them uh, about any works that we're doing. So I, I would need to follow that first, but that's not uh, that's normal. Uh, in terms of, you know, I like to say things because it, you know, it sounds good. No, I'm not. This is how we've been working for a long, long time, and we we work with all the IDBs <laughs> in the area. And I think at some time in the recent past. Uh, agency staff would have been talking to your local IDB on a range of issues. So it's something we already do. Uh, I think what I'm just reinforcing is that we, we, we are wholly committed to it. It's not just because we think it, you know, we, we want, we've been told to do it, it's because we know it's the right thing to do. Uh, just going back to the example before of Holderness and Burstwick, the work we did there in the past, the local community now uh, run all the pumps. They, they, we provided the pumps to the local community. Uh, a local farmer keeps them. Uh, we train them how to use them, so they provide their own flood resilience. That's something that's happened several years ago now. So we've got examples across the whole of Yorkshire uh, where we've done things in partnership uh, and worked together. I know we keep having very, very different conversations about dredging, uh, and we need to try and find a way through that because I think it's it's becoming a blockage to working together and. and but, you know, and, and what I'm doing is, it's gone for a long, long time. We've got to find a way past it. I don't disagree, or just I agree. But I think we have to get confused between land drainage, dredging for land drainage, and dredging for for flooding. And clearly, they both are important. They're both interlinked. But we've got to. I think I would hope we can move past this being a blockage. And, and, and make sure we're. To be fair, Craig, I don't think any 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 speaker here, anybody that's put a question to you, has mentioned the word dredging. I don't think I've heard that from anybody. Not dredging as such. You've reprinted dredging. It's a hot topic. It's all over the papers. But I'm sorry, the, the, the point that Mr. Hay made, I'm, I'm vice chairman of that drainage board. The consultation you've done with our DP, uh, our drainage board, has been zero. 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 So, and, and, and it's been taken on board for 30 years. So, I'm sorry, I told us about it. There's no blame there. Okay, well, I'll take that because you know, we were, we were, if we're consulting on local matters, we should have written to you here and sent you the consultation documents. I'd be staggered if we haven't, if we haven't. Well, I'm not sure, as I said, my father was the chairman before that, and it is zero. Well, my apologies from the Environment Agency, uh, unreservedly. Um, and, and if, if I did mention dredging and nobody else did, I apologise. I think I'm just talking generally about, I think we are talking about dredging somewhere here. Uh, we're talking about, you know, how we look after our rivers and maintain them, and that's the conversation that we're trying to get to the bottom of. We'll just take, we'll just take this guy down here, he's had his hand up so many times, and then I really am going to wind this afternoon up because I'm aware of what time it is, uh, and uh, people do want to go home. Well, I feel very much, thank you very much. Uh, Will McBain from Arab. Um, I work in, uh, for an engineering consultancy, and uh, I've worked with the Environment Agency, Yorkshire Water, and a lot of different organisations. Um, delivering infrastructure. And uh, one of the big things as in the profession we appreciate is that the value of our infrastructure is, is constantly um, undervalued. We don't really, as, as Richard was saying, we don't put a proper value on the infrastructure we can create. And often we work in a straitjacket straight of, of, of funding rules. Um, if you take the example of Selby, for example, I can tell you that if you follow the rules that you're given to come up with a cost, uh, cost benefit solution for Selby, you will always, under the current rules, come up with raise the banks or raise the walls around, around that town. You would never come up with the imaginative, more exciting, major projects that, 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 um, that you're suggesting that have because of the, of the rules and those straitjackets. But there's nothing stopping us, and there's nothing stopping Yorkshire from coming up with some more compelling ideas that take on some of these, these um, constraints that are placed upon each individual organisation. Um, and the pilot, the, the, 
partnership projects in Den Haag, there, there, there are opportunities there to cross the boundaries, to pool resources, to come up with something really quite special and creative um, and economic, but it does require imagination. And uh, I think uh, as, as Yorkshire people, we could uh, well come up with a, a more imaginative plan for how we manage water in this, in this great uh, county. And uh, I think with the recent events that have occurred, uh, it couldn't be a better time to start making such plans with the hope of getting support from the government. Thank you. I think we will draw it to a close now, and I think that was a pretty well made point. Uh, Yorkshire is the famous county as far as I'm concerned in this country, and we need to lead the way in which way we go, certainly on these water issues. But first of all, I'm going to say a few thank yous here. I'm going to thank, firstly thank Farah for hosting the event, super venue. Uh, thank all our speakers, our sponsors, our sponsor, sponsors, our legacy funding for the former Rural Affairs Forum, DEFRA Skills, Yorkshire Water, Environment Agency, McCain's Food and Yorkshire Agricultural Society. I would like to say one special thank you to somebody who's organised today and that's Liz Hudson. So thank you Liz. All this would not have happened without all the hard work. It's been a hugely thought-provoking day and it's so important that we highlight some key out outcomes and take-home messages when I go to see Dan Rogerson with several other people, hopefully. I think the first thing that I think most of all, land is a finite resource that we must protect. But with land, I think we've got to bracket water into that. Because we do need to double food production by 2050 due to a predicted population increase to in excess of 9 billion people. So we have a real challenge on our hands and I think as I say, Yorkshire can lead the way in this. But I can assure you ladies and gentlemen, when I and others go or meet with Dan Rogerson, we will not stand idly by. These points that we want to put across it, the time is right. There never has been a better time. We need to work together. We do not need scapegoats. We need to put these matters correct that are not correct. And I will give you my guarantee that hopefully things will move forward. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to close the summit today. And thank you all very much for coming. And uh, a cup of tea afterwards, if anybody wants one. So thank you.